Okay, uh, today's lecture is going to be multifaceted and is going to address a number of poetic techniques uh, Charles Wright incorporates into each section of the collection for a variety of reasons. So let's sort of excavate the poetic landscape surrounding Wright's use of, as you can see here, question, his infusion of parallels, and how the speaker is understanding the, or, sorry, underscoring the concept of halves, half this, half that. There is uh, an abundance of questions, uh, Wright the speaker posed across the breadth of this collection of poetry. The question must be asked then as to what the questions are adding to the work. Why would Wright infuse a profuse amount of questions across the terrain of the entire collection? I think we could find a hint of the answer early on uh, in the collection, a place within any collection of poetry where the author has to lay the groundwork, the schematic of sorts of how he or she wants the reader to enter and interpret the text at hand. In the poem, as we can see here, reading Lao Tzu again in the new year, the last few lines on page six read, Structure rise in the mind and fall. Failure recedes the old ground. Does the grass with its inches in two worlds love the dirt? Does the snowflake the raindrop? I've heard that those who know will never tell us, and heard that those who tell us will never know. Words are wrong. Structures are wrong. Even the questions are compromise. We do get a series of questions here, but to what end? What is obtained by posing questions here? Introspection would be one, a sort of plumbing the depths of the human condition, which surely Wright and the speaker as one are engaging in. What especially stands out is the last line on page six, quote, even the questions are compromised, unquote. This is the groundwork being laid I spoke about, the concept that in the absence of answers, that very thing a question is in a, on a quest for, what will satisfy the questioner then? If without answers here, Wright seems to be hinting at the idea that without answers to his speaker's inquiries, the inquiries must themselves suffice in some small way until the answer can be revealed, if even at all. Let's take a look at other questions posed by Wright. Okay, still sticking uh, with um, page six, uh, we get, does the grass with its inches and two rolls love the dirt? Does the snowflake the raindrop? These questions seem to be hinting at the duplicity of the world. What I'll talk about in a few slides is halves and even parallels. Halves being something section two of this collection is semi-obsessed with. But the snow here is one object that exists in a world with a set amount of requisite conditions, namely temperature and precipitation. This is its world. Likewise, rain is an, is an object that exists in a world with its set amount of requisite conditions, also temperature and precipitation. Each similar, but each in an opposite, so on opposite sides of the spectrum of temperature needs, coexisting in a duplicity of sorts. How complicated the world is, even down to the elemental, Wright seems to be demonstrating here. On page four, we get, whatever happened to the dark sublime, sin of the third eye, cross gap between flesh and abstraction, so a series of questions. On page eight, we get a series of questions again. Where is it written, the season's decrease diminishes me? Should we long for st stillness, a hush for the trivial body washed in the colors of paradise, dirt colored, water colored, match flame and wind colored? and so on, who has never understood the void? Should I give counsel to the darkness, honor the condor's wing? Should we keep on bowing to an inch of this, an inch of that? Again, we get the idea of inch as we did head above with the grass. Uh, this complicated idea of inches, how all is sort of part this and part that, a type of what's the word called gestalt, used in psychology a lot, whereby the whole is a piecemeal for many moving parts. There is no simple answer, uh, Wright seems to be saying. On page 15, we get, what do I have to look forward to at 54? So that short line of questioning. On page 17, we get, who listens to anyone? Another short line of questioning. But on page 30, we start to get a little more complicated in the line of questioning. After it's all over, after the last gaze has shut down, will I become the landscape I've looked at and walked through, or the road that took me here, or the time it took to arrive? Still on page 30, we get, how are we balanced out by measure, number, and weight? Is the Renaissance headed the idea of God with a compass or gold protractor in his hand? Okay, so there are a num number uh, of more examples within later sections, I'm sure of it. Uh, I leave that task up to you if you wish to craft an essay around the concept of Wright's intentional line of questioning within Chickamauga. Something that coexists with, with great proximity to Wright's line of questioning are the halves. Let's take a look at a few examples and even pose some of our own questions as to why the concept of the half is important to Wright and his speaker. Okay, still sticking with the second section. Within the entire second section, we are introduced to language uh, that outright tells us how much the poet is concerned with the halves of this world. On page 30, we get the speaker talking about the sky that is, quote, stretched like a tent half above the sky. 
uh, on page 31, we get the speaker talking about the ocean state being, quote, between moon pole and earth pole. That push and pull effect seems to be relevant a concept here. How it seems to be asking, how are we all pushed in one to one place only to be pulled to another, such as work, school, relationships, phases of life? I think phases of life is a, is a sort of a big capital letter question uh, that Wright is posing through the speaker in Chickamauga. On page 35, we get the last line, which are also framed as half uh, as half a question. Uh, quote, but us half hidden behind a bathroom window curtain? I guess so. On page 36, we get some description of the landscape as, quote, feathery, feathery, half brown, and later in the same poem, still describing the landscape, uh, quote, into the lakescape's lockbox or sepia half tones, half lost and half forgotten. So some definite halves going on. I started tracking the concept of, of the infusion of halves only when I got to the second section. Um, of this collection. I'm convinced, however, there will be more instances, instances of it in later sections. This too could be a great subject of your essays, giving instances of halves, then entering some level of supposition as to why. Perhaps the inspection, even mediation, sorry, meditation on halves is a commentary on the simplicity yet complexity of this world. I think that would be one good door to walk through with regard to it if you choose this topic. I'll be intrigued, however, to hear uh, your take if you choose this uh, subject matter. Okay, so parallels. Uh, like questions, like halves, the parallels Wright draws upon within this collection seem to become the amalgamation of those two very things. For me, the parallels are a balancing act for the speaker who Wright needs to question the world, realizing it is split down the middle because nothing after all is absolutely absolute, he seems to be saying. Leaving us with the great indecision of halves. Here are some of the parallels within Chickamauga. Page 11, we get in the wrong place, in the wrong time. So he's paralleling place and time. Page 12, we get the color of mountains both is and is not. So the parallel here is held within bothness. Things aren't so simple as is, but must contain is not as a type of bothness here. A line later, we get partial, then not partial. Nothing is simple as just being partial, uh, being one thing. Page 16, we get thermostat on and off, making what isn't as if it were. So on and off, never just one thing, as well as something that is both is and is not. Page 18, we get if time is water appearing and disappearing, so the parallel made possible by the ethereal, even cyclical state of water, here and not here. Finally, on page 19, we get how common it all was, or it, it all was, how uncommon I pictured myself. So parallel being how the world can exist with one foot planted in the waters of common and another stomping in the murky waters of uncommon. Okay, questions. As always, please email me if any questions or concerns or inquiries of any sort. I've received most of your second, or most if not all of your second essay on Here Bullet. I'll grade those and give those back on Monday. Uh, look out uh, for an open-ended question on Chickamauga posted to Blackboard by noon tomorrow, which is May 21st. So let me know if you have any questions. Talk to you guys then. Bye.